The 2019 Pacific salmon season was a disaster. Pacific salmon are facing an unprecedented crisis. British Columbia is in real danger of losing its most iconic fish. Countless runs are endangered, including the Nanaimo River runs. I've heard from First Nations leaders, commercial fishermen, sports fishermen, and advocacy groups on this issue. The government needs to take urgent action, restore an adequate budget for salmon stock assessments, commit more resources to the DFO Salmon Enhancement Program, increase the salmon conservation stamp fee on fishing licenses, legislate the move to close containment salmon farms immediately, and provide emergency relief packages for commercial fishers and First Nations. There's still time to save the Pacific salmon, but we must act now before it's too late. The Honourable Member for St. John Rothsay. Mr. Speaker, during the last election campaign, I pledge to stand up for democratic reform in this place if re-elected. Now I'm back. I rise to begin fulfilling this pledge by addressing my many fellow members through you about this historic opportunity to improve democratic character of this place that lies before us in this minority parliament. By amending our standing orders to ensure that all members of this House are fully empowered to advocate for their constituents on Parliament Hill, whether it be by creating a parallel chamber or tackling party discipline, we can ensure that the voices of voters are not drowned out by acrimonious partisan rhetoric and voting patterns in the People's House. On Election Day, our names come first and our parties come second on the ballots cast by our constituents. Let us all put our constituents first in this Parliament. Let us seize this historic opportunity to work across party lines to implement the democratic reform this place needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to celebrate some great news for Dawson Creek and the South Peace. And I must say, Dawson Creek has a special place in my heart because that's where I was born. Last week, WestJet announced that it will be adding a new non-stop daily service between Dawson Creek and Calgary. As you know, Mr. Speaker, air travel to and from northern communities is uh, crucial to the... And so beginning April 26th this year, round service on WestJet Link will begin. Our local airports are an important part of our growing community in northeastern BC, and having competitive air service is essential for keeping our economy moving and linking our communities together. I'd like to congratulate WestJet and a special thank you to our Mayor, Del Bumstead, and the many people of Dawson Creek who worked so hard to bring this new service to the area. And Mr. Speaker, I can't wait to be one of the first passengers on this inaugural flight. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for London West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. All Canadians are familiar with Terry Fox and his Marathon of Hope. Fewer are familiar with the person who coined the phrase Marathon of Hope and who helped convince the Canadian Cancer Society to take a chance on this young man's dream. Ron Calhoun from London was that person. Even after Terry's untimely death, Ron worked to ensure Terry's goal was realized. Ron's love for community and sense of duty motivated him to support big causes that could make a real difference. He developed the Ladies' Great Ride Against Cancer and nurtured it as the initiative went global. In the 1990s, Ron volunteered again, this time for Jesse's Journey, supporting John and Jesse Davidson in their wheelchair trek across Ontario and later John's Cross Canada walk to raise funds to fight Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Mr. Speaker, Ron passed away earlier this month at the age of 86, but his continual commitment to make life better for people should never be forgotten. My sincere condolences to Ron's family and many friends across Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday was a very hard day for the community of La Prairie. There was a multi-vehicle crash involving more than 200 vehicles, which unfortunately led to the death of two individuals, including about 60 injured. A real tragedy, Mr. Speaker. Our thoughts and my colleagues' thoughts go to all the families living this tragedy. During this difficult time, I would like to acknowledge the incredible work undertaken by the various services, firefighters, police services, paramedics, 
various authorities and the city of La Prairie, including the mayor, Mr. Donat Serre. These people are so important, so brave when awful situations like this arise, such as the one yesterday afternoon. We are fortunate to be able to count on these people during such difficult times. The member for Saint-Jean and myself offer our sincere condolences to the families and the loved ones of the two victims. The Honourable Member for Marcorel Fortin. Mr. Speaker, it is essential to invest in young people in order to ensure Canada's prosperity. With the Canada Summer Jobs Program, our government is committed to helping our youth acquire the skills, work experience and abilities they need to succeed in their transition to the labour market. In Marcorel Fortin last year, this program came with an investment of almost $682 million and it created 233 jobs. I am therefore using my time in the House today to remind employers that they have until February 24, 2020 to apply for funding on the government website. And Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my three colleagues from Laval, Laval des Îles, Alfred Pellan, and Vimy. I'd like to thank them for their presence. For Mission Maskey Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, what if I were to tell you about a building material that is affordable, sustainable, renewable, and sequesters carbon? What if I were to tell you about a sector of our economy that supports First Nations and rural Canada? Well, Mr. Speaker, that's the forestry sector, and it's being completely ignored by the Liberal government. We've lost opportunities to fight climate change because the Liberals have failed to get a softwood lumber agreement with the United States. And now, Mr. Speaker, thousands of people are out of work, thousands of families are struggling, and forestry companies are protesting with their feet and leaving for the United States. We hear a lot of verbal appeasement about protecting jobs in this sector from a government that purports to balance the economy and the environment. So why is this Liberal turning their back on British Columbia? Why is this government turning their back on the thousands of forestry workers, many in my riding? Enough is enough. When will we see some actions? When will they help Canadian workers get ahead? Mr. Speaker, last November, we lost a Canadian giant. Dr. Fouad Shaheen immigrated to Canada in 1958. He settled in the Niagara region and worked as a neurologist until his retirement. Since his arrival to Canada, he championed several charitable causes and interfaith dialogue. In 1984, in response to the famine in Ethiopia, Dr. Shaheen helped found the International Development and Relief Foundation. Today, IDRF is one of the most respected charities that's providing assistance to millions in 42 countries and here in Canada. For his exceptional commitment to humanity, Dr. Shaheen became the first Turkish Canadian to receive the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada. He was also recognized by the Max Gala with their Lifetime Achievement Award. We will miss Dr. Shaheen's wisdom, passion, and optimism. I offer my deep condolences to his family and the entire team at IDRF. He left behind a profound legacy that is still making a difference in the world today. The Honourable Member for Louis Hébert. Mr. Speaker, on February 11, 2020, in Quebec City, the 96-year-old geographer Louis Edmond Amelin died. He was a writer, he was an advocate for Indigenous rights, and he was especially a visionary for the North. Louis Edmond Amelin was the father of Northern Studies in Quebec. He was devoted to studying the ice, the land of ice, and its peoples. He lived and visited the northern communities many times. He was interested in their cultures. His passion for the north opened unexplored paths. He was the founder 
of Quebec's Geographic Institute and the Northern Study Centre in 1961, which continues its work this day. He was also well known for his studies of the permafrost. His studies and his papers have inspired several generations of thinkers. Mr. Speaker, it's impossible for me in such a short time to pay tribute to such an important legacy. Thank you, Mr. Amelin. I'd like to remind members that member statements are personal statements that we would like everyone to be able to hear, and the noise in the House makes this difficult. ...by members is something that's very personal that members want other members to hear, and there's a rumbling going on in, in conversations. If you don't mind keeping it down so we can hear what the honourable members have to say. The honourable member for Calgary, Midnapore. Mr. Speaker, in recent weeks, I've noticed a shadow minister for families, children, and social development. Several ministers have dropped into Alberta to make announcements about affordable housing for the province. 200 units here, 96 units there. But Albertans won't be fooled. They know that it's this Liberal government killing their economy with their anti-pipeline legislation, delaying of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, wavering on the approval of Tech Frontier, and now not upholding the rule of law with the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline project. Alberta lost 19,000 jobs in January, and the number of Albertans who foreclosed on their own homes continues to rise. This Liberal government needs to realize that their province destroying policies based on anti-energy ideology is making life increasingly unaffordable for Albertans, while at the same time killing their opportunity for livelihood. Adding more affordable housing units is not going to fix the real problem, and it's time the Liberals admitted this. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Pickering Uxbridge. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to commend three incredible members of my community who, at the ages of eight, three, and four, inspired our community to come together and provide relief aid for the Australian wild wildfires. When, Malie, when Mila, Paisley, and Maverick learned about the devastating wildfires at school, they wanted to help the animals any way they could. After discussing ideas with their parents, they decided to lead a bottle drive across Uxbridge and donate the funds to WIRES, the largest wildlife rescue organization in Australia. Three drop-off locations were set up across town and thousands of bottles were collected. This fundraiser ended up inspiring further initiatives in town, including the owners of our local IDA pharmacy, Hank and Vidhi, deciding to donate 50% of all profits on January 12th. After a few weeks of hard work, Mila, Paisley and Maverick raised 3400 Australian dollars, proving that no matter what age, you can make meaningful change here at home and around the world. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Forrest Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, we've heard a lot about the blockades that have done so much damage to our economy, but there is one thing that seems to be consistently overlooked. We haven't heard this Prime Minister acknowledge even once that this project has support from the Wet'suwet'en elected council, the majority of their hereditary chiefs, yeah, yeah. and that there are 20 signed benefits agreements with nations along the route. Many of them are already working on the pipeline, and these blockades are affecting their local and the national economy. For years, we have listened to First Nations leaders talking about the chronically high unemployment rates, addictions, and suicides. Now, these northern nations have taken control of their own destiny, but the project is still stalled. The Liberals should consider supporting their efforts to change that and support the national economy. Thank you. Well done. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is a leadership crisis enveloping our nation. Protests are happening across Canada with the goal to shut Canada down. Our world-class energy industry is being shut down because of the Prime Minister's interventions and refusal to look at the national interest. Rural crime is at unprecedented levels and has destroyed the quality of life that we enjoy in rural Alberta. The Liberals are criminalizing law-abiding firearms owners while ignoring the real criminals. The Liberals, the, the middle class, something they can't even define, are hurting while we see record numbers of insolvencies. 
The federal fiscal outlook is a mess. Canada has taken a diminished role on the world stage. Agricultural is hurting from, from high taxes and the inability to access markets. The Liberal attempts at Indigenous reconciliation are shown to be a failure. The PM's environmental plan punishes Canadians while not actually helping the planet. And Mr. Speaker, this is just a few examples. Last Saturday's National Post headline quoted, leaderless, Canada needs better. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, last spring, a half a million people marched in the streets of Montreal. It was the biggest demonstration in our history. Why were they marching? They were demanding real action to fight climate change. They know that we need to urgently and drastically reduce our carbon footprint in order to avoid an environmental catastrophe. And when your house is burning, then you stop putting logs in your fireplace. But Liberals keep breaking their promises, and they're victims of the oil lobby. They promise to end subsidies to oil corporations. According to a study published by Equiterre, and the Minister of Heritage probably remembers who they are, last year, subsidies to oil corporations not only continued, but increased. The Liberals are making the problem worse. It's time to stop giving gifts to oil companies, to pull the plug on wasteful projects like Trans Mountain, and it's time to turn down projects like Tech Frontier and LNG. It's a minute to midnight, and it's time to act for future generations. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, during Black History Month, I am rising to speak on behalf of Marjorie Villefranche today, director of the Maison d'Haïti, who has this to say. We people of African descent want to be heard because we believe that in 2020, racism and discrimination should no longer exist. We want to develop a society that is fair and where no one is excluded a society that lives the values that are non-racist, non-sexist, and non-violent. We want to be heard because we no longer want the color of our skin to determine our future nor that of our children. We don't want empty promises. We want courageous action that will lead to justice. We want to be recognized as individuals who have fully contributed to the development of our society, to its human, political, economic, cultural, and artistic development. We, people of African descent, want to celebrate, along with our fellow citizens, our indomitable will to live with our heads held high. Thank you. Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, today we honour the lives and memories of the Heavenly Hundred. For three months, thousands of Ukrainians occupied Kiev's Independence Square and peacefully protested the corrupt regime of President Viktor Yanukovych. I stood on the Maidan in Ukraine six years ago among the ash and bloodstains left from the brutal crackdown on these innocent Euromaidan protesters. Their bravery and sacrifice as they stood up against Yanukovych's thugs deserve our highest praise. Ukraine and their friends around the world now carry forward the legacy of the Heavenly Hundred and all those who took part in the revolution of dignity as the battle for democracy and the territorial integrity of Ukraine continues even today. Canada's Conservatives will always support the people of Ukraine in their pursuit of freedom, democracy, and human rights. Slava Ukraini, Hiram Slava. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, the people of Sherbrooke, like our government, share the same philosophy and that is that the environment and the economy go hand in hand. It's because of this philosophy that we were able to help a business in my riding, Motrek International. They are a key manufacturer of steel electric vehicles. And I'd like to congratulate Blair McIntosh, their CEO and employees, Mario and Sylvain, who I had an opportunity to speak with when I visited the factory. It's because we chose to invest in small and medi medium-sized businesses that we've been able to create more than one million jobs since 2015. I am proud to be part of a government that works for our regions like Sherbrooke, and especially that gives our communities the financial levers that they need to grow. Question oral. Oral questions. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, one of the many ways you can tell that the Prime Minister doesn't know what he's doing is when his message changes every single day. First, the Prime Minister elevated the protesters, talking about how they were defending their communities in the cold. Then he tried to make a link between radical anti-energy activists and reconciliation. Then he said that the protests were illegal, but that it wasn't up to him to enforce the rule Fair. of law. So, simple question, can the Prime Minister tell us on what day these illegal blockades will come down? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government knows that the current situation is having a bit of development in this dispute. Mr. Speaker, the BC RCMP have advised that they have made a decision to deploy their officers based on their assessment of the conditions that exist in the Wet'suwet'en territory. The BC RCMP has made this operational decision, and Mr. Speaker, we trust their ability to assess the situation and to keep the public safe. Mr. Speaker, we believe that the time has come for the barricades to come down, and we are working towards addressing the circumstances that gave rise to it and to resolving those as peaceably as possible. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is once again offering concessions to those who have more resolve than he does. And now that the RCMP have been ordered to leave Wet'suwet'en territory, there are major questions about whether or not this project will actually go ahead. So, the Prime Minister has already told these radical anti-energy protesters that he will not do anything to enforce the law. Can he give a guarantee, at least tell those people who are breaking the law, trying to hold up this important project, will he at least give a 100 percent guarantee that Coastal Gas Link will be built, yes or no? Yeah. Uh, I, I need, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, to correct something that the member opposite said. The Supreme Court has said police independent under, underpins the rule of law, and in these circumstances, no direction was given to the RCMP. The decisions made by the RCMP were based on their ex professional experience, their law, and their assessment on the situation on the ground. Mr. Speaker, they've made important decisions to try to resolve this peacefully. They have our trust and confidence, and we'll continue to work hard to resolve this appropriately. I just want to remind the honourable members that people want to hear what's asked and what's answered. And by shouting while the both are going on really doesn't help the matter. So I just want to remind everyone in case they forgot what the rules of the house were. The honourable member, l'honorable député de Richmond. The honourable member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, we're now in day 15 of the blockades. The third week is just beginning and still no leadership from the Prime Minister and no plan. François Legault and several other premiers have asked the Prime Minister for an idea how long it's going to take to find a way out of this. Mr. Speaker, is there anyone in charge in this government who understands the urgency of the situation? Could the Prime Minister for once show a minimum of leadership and table a timeline with a plan? The Honourable Minister of Transport. We understand the situation full well, and we're working very closely with the provinces all across Canada because this is a challenge we have to address both federally and provincially. And that's why the Prime Minister will be talking later this afternoon with François Legault and his provincial counterparts from other provinces. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, while the Prime Minister and his ministers are taking selfies for Twitter. We learn that thousands of employees have been laid off at Via Rail and CN and other places all across Canada in all regions. 4,500 rail cars have been held up and with all their freight. When will the Prime Minister stop ignoring all the alarm bells, show a minimum of leadership and table a plan with a timeline. The Honourable Minister, I'd like to reassure my colleague and all Canadians that we are very, very aware of the economic impact of these protests, and we are determined to resolve the situation as quickly as possible. We know there are shortages of certain pro products. We are aware of the layoffs. We want to put an end to this as quickly as possible through dialogue to come up with a peaceful resolution to the problem. That's what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Belleuil-Chambly. Mr. Speaker, 
I'm concerned that we're all having to get through an incredible fog of confusion, confusing patience with inaction. The prime minister didn't want to speak to the other premiers, and there, now, there was supposed to be a discussion before question period today. Now we learn that it will be after. Maybe we won't know what comes of that until next Tuesday. Can we just find out what the prime minister is going to commit to this afternoon? Donald, Minister of Indigenous Services. I'd like to thank the member opposite for his question. As everyone knows, the hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en are now traveling toward uh, a, a site where there, a meeting will be held, and hopefully this will happen as soon as possible with a view to finding a peaceful resolution. Myself and the Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations are willing to uh, involve ourselves immediately. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Mr. Speaker, the only thing that's been done so far was done by the RCMP. And the government says the RCMP is independent. So that means that the government so far has done nothing. If there are some Wet'suwet'en chiefs coming to Eastern Canada for discussions, but has there, have there been any clear proposals about the work on the project, or is it just the same old talk that we keep getting served up over and over again? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that we're all encouraged by the recent developments with the RCMP in BC, which gives the hereditary chiefs an opportunity to sit down and negotiate a long-term plan for their territory. As everyone knows, we are willing to get into that respectful discussion, but we have a very clear uh, path to follow, but we're not going to make that public for the time being. We're asking Canadians to be patient for just a little bit longer, but we will get there, I'm sure of that. Thank you very much. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs called for a meeting for months with the Prime Minister, and today there's a report from those chiefs uh, suggesting that they still want a meeting with the Prime Minister. Very clear. They want to meet with the Prime Minister specifically. So my question is very simple. Will the Prime Minister meet the chiefs of the hereditary region in Wet'suwet'en? Again, Mr. Speaker, I think we can all be heartened by the development that has happened in BC with the That's right. RCMP has extended to the hereditary yeah. chiefs. It's an opportunity to sit down and continue that dialogue. Uh, this is a positive development, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the move from, of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, the Tyananega, is a positive development. I think everyone in this uh, House is, is dedicated to a peaceful resolution of this. There are clear steps to de-escalation. Uh, myself and the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations stand ready to engage with uh, leadership in Tyananega as soon and as when and as early as tonight to go and meet them and discuss this peaceful resolution. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, that's not what I asked, and more importantly, that's not what the hereditary chiefs of Wet'suwet'en have asked for. Yeah. They've asked to speak with the Prime Minister yeah. directly, right. not the ministers, not another delegate, but the Prime Minister Prime directly. Minister. What has the Prime Minister done? Has he responded to the invitation? Has he picked up a phone and called? You know what? Here's an opportunity. The government can commit today in this House that the Prime Minister will meet with the chiefs, the hereditary chiefs of Wet'suwet'en. Now, today, there's an opportunity. Will the Prime Minister commit to meet with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs, the Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services? Speaker, everyone pretends to know uh, what the requests are. You can't know what those requests are unless you actually ask the people. It isn't a question of looking at the banners on the street. It's actually talking to the leadership in question, and that's precisely what we've done, Mr. Speaker. The entire cabinet is seized of this in incredibly urgent issue. Uh, it is a situation that evolves minute by minute. Myself and the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, as well as other ministers, stand ready to engage on a moment's notice, and that's precisely what we will do. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, this 
Prime Minister's weak leadership is holding the Canadian economy hostage. These illegal blockades are just another example of Canada signaling to the world that we are closed for business. We fail to deliver big nation-building projects because of a handful of radical protesters backed by American money. When will the Prime Minister stop giving these activists Absolutely. permission to shut down our country? Mr. Speaker, I think it's, it's very important to provide this House with some clarity. The, the RCMP Act and federal authorities do not extend to provincial police services, and in the demonstrations and, and, and blockades that are taking place across the country, they are actually in provincial jurisdictions. That's the responsibility of the police of local jurisdiction under their provincial police acts. Our government's role is to try to mediate a recon and reconcile the issues that gave rise to these disputes in the first place, Mr. Speaker, and, and that is the work that we are doing in assistance to a peaceful resolution to these disputes. A member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. The Prime Minister's weak response to this national crisis shows his unwillingness to act to do what's in the best interest of all Canadians. Canadians have the right to freedom of speech and freedom of protest, but they do not have the right to break the law, completely shut down Canada's economy, and prevent other Canadians from going to work. What is this Prime Minister's action plan? When is he going to this and put an end to these illegal blockades. Again, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to, for everyone to understand that decisions made by the police, whether by the RCMP in their jurisdiction or by provincial police services across the country, are based on their professional experience, their understanding of the law, and their interpretation of the circumstances on the ground. They will continue to do that work without any political interference from this government. And, and so we are supporting their work. We trust them to do their job, but we are not in any way interfering or impeding their ability to do their work. Before I go on to the next member who has a question, I'm sure we all want to hear it. We all want to hear the answer. I just want to remind uh, members that shouting doesn't really help anything. And I just want to remember, remind the honourable members, when you're talking about someone, refer to them as their, by their title or by their writing. Shouting their name is, I guess, could be breaking laws, and we don't want anyone to break the rules in here. The honourable member. to both sides. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker, and it's great that you get it. Gary Nizel, a Wet'suwet'en community member and hereditary chief, said in a recent interview he has to provide for his family. He said he worked in the mines for five years in B.C. and Alberta and left that to work at CGL in his own territory. He said his ancestors, including his grandparents, would have been proud of him for working on his own territory. Instead of emboldening the anti-government, anti-reason, anti-everything activists, why won't this weak prime minister stand strong? with the West of Wooten community, stand up for our laws, get the illegal blockades removed, and get our economy moving again. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we, we understand and fully support the urgency of, of our work to resolve this as peacefully as, as possible. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, I believe the time has come for the barricades to come down. We have been working diligently to address the circumstances that led to those blockades, and as a result of their very responsive and responsible decision made by the RCMP, I believe the conditions have now been met to allow for a more amenable and peaceful resolution. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work on a speedy resolution of this dispute and get Canadians back to work. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles I understand that the Minister doesn't have power over the RCMP in B.C., but can the Minister say what control he does have over the RCMP under Section 5 of the Act? Can the Minister answer that question? 
I'm, I'm very happy to. And as I've already said, Mr. Speaker, the Supreme Court of Canada has said police independence underpins the rule of law. And, and that independence is absolutely crucial to maintaining public trust. All directions to the RCMP are prescribed by three conditions, Mr. Speaker. They cannot require the force to disregard their lawful duties. I cannot infringe upon the independence of the RCMP, and I cannot ask them to reach beyond federal jurisdiction. That means, Mr. Speaker, we do not direct them in their operational decisions in the day-to-day -day policing of the communities that they are responsible for. Blockades are not about the coastal gas link. The project is not even controversial. The 20 elected authorities along the path of the pipeline support, and even an NDP government supports it. It will reduce global greenhouse gas emissions is about law breakers trying to get concessions. But if you reward law breaking with concessions, you will get more law breaking. Imagine the damage they will do when an actual controversial project comes along. So what concessions is this government contemplating to the law breakers, and how much more law breaking does this government plan to encourage? Mr. Speaker, at no time have we ever countenanced law breaking, but at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we understand on this side of the House that reconciliation remains a priority not just for our government but for all Canadians. We've been working very hard to support law enforcement efforts in their respective jurisdictions to resolve the circumstances that have led to these blockades. That's our responsibility, Mr. Speaker, and we've been working hard to address the conditions and the concerns that gave rise to these blockades. The responsibility for upholding the law and maintaining public safety is, in fact, the responsibility of the police of those respective jurisdictions. Honourable Member for Carlton. But it's just a warm-up act. There are other projects ahead of us. The government is spending $17 billion on a pipeline that it can't even build. When that construction actually gets underway, imagine the law-breaking that is going to be unleashed by the incentives that this government is giving this group of lawbreakers. Yes. Everyone's watching, Mr. Speaker. Is this government going to reward lawbreaking on this project and, and promote much more of it on projects to come? Mr. Speaker, I would remind the member opposite and all members of this House of some of our experiences with these previous uh, disruptions of, of service and blockades that have occurred. Perhaps we should remember the outcome of Ipperwash, remember Caledonia, remember previous blockades. And, Mr. Speaker, we should also reflect that when, when that has resulted in, in, in overwhelming police action, it can result in additional blockades. The best path forward for, to protect Canadians' interests is a peaceful resolution of this dispute. We're working hard to achieve that peaceful resolution. Order, order. I just want to remind everyone. I'm not sure what's going on. Thursday afternoons usually are quieter than this, so uh, maybe it. Because yesterday was relatively quiet, so I just want to remind the honourable members to keep it down so we can hear the questions and the answers. Uh, the honourable the honourable the honourable member for Shefford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. People are fed up. The blockades are threatening thousands of workers with layoffs. In my own riding, for example, Bow Group is no longer getting the raw materials it needs to produce its plumbing products. Fifty people will lose their jobs by the end of the week if the government doesn't resolve this crisis. And the end of the week is tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. And that's just one example among many. Does the government realize how big this crisis is and how urgently it has to be resolved for the sake of workers all across Quebec? The Honorable Minister of Transport. We fully realize the scope of the problem, and we understand the difficulties that Canadians are currently experiencing because of these blockades. We know that we have to find a solution as quickly as possible. We also know that this solution will be arrived at through dialogue so that it's a long-term, sustainable and peaceful solution. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, the entire south shore of Montreal is being held hostage by the railway blockades. In my riding, two suburban train stations at Saint-Basile-le-Grand and Saint-Bruno-de-Montarville 
Those two stations are closed until further notice. For many of my constituents, simply commuting to work is a challenge, and they don't know whether they'll get home, be able to get home after work. After half a month of crisis, the blockades aren't, getting, aren't going away, they're growing in number. Is the government going to wait till all rail lines to Montreal are closed? The Honourable Minister of Transport. We understand how disruptive the blockades are for commuters. There's via rail and, of course, uh, public transit and CN freight. We know that the solution requires dialogue. That's the, propo the solution we recommend in order to put an end to these blockades and restore rail service as quickly as possible. We're working with our provincial partners, and the Prime Minister will be speaking to the Premiers later today. The Honourable Member for berthier masquinonge uh, Mr. Speaker, our farmers have had a tough year. First, they were abandoned by the free trade deal. They suffered from bad weather. They lost crops on account of the propane crisis in the fall. And now we're on the brink of another propane shortage due to the blockades and this government's inaction. As a result, farmers may not be able to heat their buildings anymore. My question is, What's the government doing to resolve the crisis before farmers suffer further losses? And if they do, will they be decently compensated? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we're well aware of the fact that the protests have caused certain shortages of some important products, including propane, used by farmers to dry their grains. We know that there's a looming shortage of propane, and we're working very hard to solve this problem as quickly as possible in order to get our railways back in operation so that these vital products can reach their destination. These are now into their second week, and the Liberals continue to sit on their hands. Via Rail announced it's laying off a thousand people and they cancelled service again this week. In fact, their chief executive said that this is the first time in 42 years of existence that they've had to interrupt most of their service across Canada. Mr. Speaker, the tourism industry is being directly impacted and, pe and people are cancelling their planned trips. So, can the tourism minister tell this House exactly how much this is costing our tourism industry? Great question. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, as a person who, who uses Via Rail on a weekly basis, I'm certainly very aware of the situation. It is a regrettable situation. At the moment, however, because of blockading, it is not possible to achieve all the services that Via Rail would like to be able to give. However, the good news is that certain Via trains are operating, amongst others, between Toronto and Windsor, as well as between Montreal and uh, Ottawa. So some services have resumed and we hope to get them all resuming as soon as possible. The Honourable Member for Lévis-Lobinière. Mr. Speaker, in 42 years of existence, this is the first time Via Rail has had to interrupt service to most destinations within Canada. According to CEO Cynthia Garneau, already over 1,500 jobs lost at Via Rail and CN and other repercussions on the whole economy, including tourism. Mr. Speaker, can the tourism minister tell us what economic impact the blockades will have on that industry? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. Order. I have a lot of patience. Order. Thank you. The Honourable Minister may now answer. Thank you. We're very aware 
Mr. Speaker, of the effects of certain via rail trains no longer providing service. But we're happy that some service has resumed between Toronto and Windsor and Montreal and Ottawa. And also between Le Pas, the, the Pas and Churchill and White River and Sudbury. So we're looking forward to full service resumption and we're wor working very hard to see that happen as quickly as possible. The Honourable Member for Lévis Lot Pinière. Mr. Speaker, I asked a very simple question of the tourism minister, and obviously it was unexpected, or she didn't hear it. Can the minister tell us what the what impact the blockades will have on the tourism industry? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Once again, perhaps my colleague didn't understand my answer. We're very well aware of the fact that via rail service is very important, not only to tourism, but to travelers like myself. I take the train every week to get to work and to go home on the weekend. So we want to resolve this situation as quickly as possible. And the good news is that some trains are operating right now. We're working very hard to bring them all back online uh, all across the country. Winnipeg Center. Mr. Speaker, this government committed to implementing all 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 16 times the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is referenced as the framework for reconciliation. There is no reconciliation in the absence of justice. Now the government is stalling on presenting their UNDRIP bill using the current events with the Wet'suwet'en people. Mr. Speaker, is this is the Prime Minister's way to punish Indigenous people standing up for their rights? Or was he never going to follow through in the first place? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question. Mr. Speaker, the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples has always been a priority for our government. Our commitment was included in both our platform and in our speech from the throne. It's in my mandate letter, Mr. Speaker, to implement by the end of the year 2020. We remain committed to doing just that. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Indigenous youth are marching in streets across this country with signs that say reconciliation is dead. That's on this Prime Minister. They don't believe him anymore. And the trains are stopped across this country. And to get them started, this Prime Minister needs to put a credible plan on the table. And yet he continues continues to fail the test of leadership. Prime Minister can fly to Africa, he can go to Barbados, and yet he can't pick up the phone to talk to the hereditary chiefs in our own country. When is he going to show up, put his boots on, and go to Wet'suwet'en territory and de-escalate this crisis? When is he going to show up? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. I thank the member opposite for his question, and I would remind him that Wet'suwet'en hereditary leadership are on their way to Tayandanega to discuss uh, these important issues over the next two days. There is a clear plan of action to de-escalation, but that involves dialogue. And to all Canadians out there suffering, we understand that this is a very, very difficult period, and we are working diligently. Indeed, the whole cabinet is seized of this, and we will work hour by hour, minute by minute, to resolve this situation peacefully. The Honourable Member for Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, this past summer I was joined by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change with my colleagues in Brampton to highlight how this government is fighting climate change by investing in clean transportation solutions that reduce our emissions while growing the economy. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change explain to this House about how our government is supporting innovative projects that will pave the way for zero emissions transportation in Brampton and across Canada. Well, parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. I'd like to thank the member for Brampton South for her question. This past summer, our government invested over $11 million to support the world's largest fleet of interoperable battery electric buses and overhead bus charging stations for Brampton's yeah, public yeah, transit system. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we know that cleaner vehicles are good for our communities, our economy, and the environment. This critical investment in breakthrough electric bus technology will help support the Canadian clean tech sector while keeping our health healthy and leading the fight against climate change. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The ongoing rail blockades across this land 
are crippling our country and holding our economy hostage. CN and Via Rail have been forced to lay off hundreds of workers as a result of this Prime Minister's weakness. Shocking. Canadian industry is warning of empty shelves and production shutdowns will soon follow. So can the Prime Minister tell this House exactly what these blockades are costing the Canadian economy each day they go on? Where is he? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Speaker, we're very fully conscious of the impact of these blockades on the country. Yes, they are, uh, they are costing us quite a bit. There's no question about it. Because of the uh, slowdowns that uh, certain products are not getting to their destinations, because of the fact that certain people are having to be laid off, because certain materials are becoming in critical shortage at this point, we are aware of the fact that there is a significant impact due to the blockages. That's why we are working very, very hard to resolve this peacefully through dialogue as soon as possible. Mr. Speaker, the many railway blockades across the country have already had a significant impact on our agriculture sector. Western grain isn't being shipped, and farmers in Quebec and the Atlantic region are already having to ration their propane. Companies in my riding will be running out of stock as of next week. Farmers want their goods to be able to move around. They don't want temporary solutions. Does the minister have a concrete plan to get the trains running again? Honourable Minister of Transport. We are very aware of the importance of railway to the transportation of grain, particularly uh, from certain provinces. We need to be able to get that grain to port so that it can be exported. So we very much understand the anxiety our farmers may be feeling uh, in the face of this very important problem. That's why we're working hard to resolve the problem as fast as possible uh, and to do so in a peaceful and sustainable manner. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, layoffs from the, the illegal blockades are rising every day while this government does nothing. Does the Prime Minister know how many jobs have already been lost and how many Canadians will now have to struggle to rejoin the middle class once uh, because of this government's failure to uphold the rule of law? Speaker, uh, we are following extremely closely the impact that this is having, not only uh, on the Canadian economy, but that it is touching individual Canadians because, in some cases, uh, there have been layoffs in certain locations with certain companies because of the fact that the trains are not moving. That is why we were working even harder to bring this to a resolution as quickly as possible, but to do it the right way, to do it through dialogue, peacefully, and as quickly as possible. Well, member for South Surrey, White Rocks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all know that coastal gas link is good for the environment. It will replace dirty coal plants in Asia with clean, lower-emitting natural gas facilities and reduce global emissions. Trains are not moving because of this Prime Minister's weak leadership and inability to handle illegal blockades. What you permit, you promote. Yes. More trucks must be put on the road to transport goods and services. Can the Prime Minister tell this House what the environmental impact is of the emissions from these trucks? Mr. Speaker, let me, let me be very clear. As I've already said a number of times, I believe the time has come for the barricades to come down. But, but when the member suggests that it is our government that's somehow stopping the police from enf enforcing the injunctions, that's simply not correct. And, and it is the responsibility of the police of jurisdiction under their respective... I'm sure the Honourable Minister appreciates the coaching he's getting from the other side, but it's not necessary. And it's not within the rules of the House. So I just want to ask everyone to take a deep breath and we'll listen to the questions and we'll listen to the answers. The Honourable Minister. I, I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, why the members opposite are afraid to hear the truth. <laughs> the, the, reality is, the, the reality, Mr. Speaker, is the police are 
committed to resolving this situation peacefully and through our efforts to bring about a reconciliation to address the issues that gave rise to these blockades in the first place, we're providing every assistance to them in achieving that peaceful resolution. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Milles. Mr. Speaker, the consequences of the railway blockade is, are going to cost a lot of money uh, to Quebec families. This week, it seems like grocery store shelves might start to empty out for the simple reason that they won't be able to get enough supply. Furthermore, everything would lead us to believe that the price of groceries will go up because of this lack of supply. The Liberal government's lack of leadership on this issue is costing everyone dearly. So what is the Prime Minister's plan to end the blockades? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure my colleague and his constituents that we do very well understand the impact of these blockades. We know that the consequences have been very difficult for those who have been laid off and also for those who may be lacking supplies of important goods because the railways are not operational. That's exactly why we are working so hard to get this resolved as fast as possible so that the trains can get running again as soon as possible. The Honourable Member for salaberry sur -Roy. Mr. Speaker, everyone is affected by the railway blockades. Companies are laying off workers across Quebec. Montreal's South Shore has been paralyzed by the shutdown of suburban trains. Our farmers fear a second propane shortage in just three months. And grocery stores are running low on stock. After two weeks of this crisis, it's clear that almost everyone in Quebec has been impacted. Will the government finally show some leadership on this crisis? The Honourable Minister of Transport. I want to reassure my colleague that we take our responsibility very seriously. We know that we need to solve this problem because we are aware of the economic impact that it's having on Canadians and people who live in my colleague's riding, on the south shore of Montreal, and all across Canada. That's why we're working so hard to solve this problem. But we want to get it done in the right way, through dialogue, so that we can find a way to solve this crisis uh, in the long term. Mr. Speaker, in a country that respects the rule of law, all laws have to be respected. But you need to know what you're talking about, too. After 14 days of inaction, the Prime Minister finally, yesterday, took some action and said that the, the barricades are illegal. That's a step in the right direction. But you can't just talk. You need to take action. So my question for this for the Deputy Prime Minister is as follows. When will the laws be properly enforced, and when will the barricades come down? Mr. Speaker, I think it's a very important question, and I ask the member opposite because it's a great opportunity to clarify who was responsible for enforcing the laws in those jurisdictions. And it is the police of local jurisdiction. It is their responsibility. But they, they fulfill that responsibility by working diligently to resolve this as peacefully as possible. Our role and responsibility is to work with the, the, the impacted communities to seek and uh, determine a peaceful resolution. But the responsibility for enforcing the law is the responsibility of the police of jurisdiction under their respective provincial authorities. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. Canada is facing a crisis and this Prime Minister is too weak to act. Yesterday the Prime Minister finally admitted that these blockades were illegal. The preamble to the Constitution Act, championed by Pierre Trudeau himself, states that Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the rule of law. Yet, when faced with a situation which he now admits is illegal, his reaction so far has been to do nothing. Okay. Mr. Speaker, when will this weak Prime Minister recognize the founding principle and start enforcing the rule of law? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I think it's always useful when someone invokes the rule of law because it gives us an opportunity to explain to people what that means. Mm. The Supreme Court of Canada has said that police independence underpins the rule of law and it is necessary for the maintenance of public order and the preservation of the peace. 
Police independence is crucial to public trust in our institutions and of primary concern to the RCMP in their preservation of public and officer safety. Mr. Speaker, we are not in any way obstructing or interfering with the lawful decisions of the RCMP. Mr. Speaker, the previous government once said they trust the RCMP. Mr. Speaker, so do I. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. That's interesting because in 2010, the now Minister of Public Safety had zero qualms about his role as tr uh, Toronto Police Chief with his approach to protesters at the G20 summit. Oh. Yet exactly. today, he can't find it in himself to defend the rule of law in a situation where the law is clearly being broken as admitted by the Prime Minister himself. Yes. What is it about the Prime Minister's fecklessness that just seems to rub off on everybody else? This isn't a laughing matter. When is the rule of law going to be enforced? Yes. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I can, I can share with this House that in the 39 years I was a police officer and 10 years as the Chief of Police in Toronto, I never submitted to any political interference in any decision I made. And Mr. Speaker, I would take the opportunity to once again remind the members of this House that police independence underpins the rule of law. Operational decisions on the enforcement of that law are made independently by our police services. Mr. Speaker, we trust their judgment. Good. The Honourable Member for Brampton Centre. The President of the Treasury Board, table supplementary estimated B, in this place on Tuesday. Could the President of the Treasury Board update the House on new budgetary spendings plans found within the supplementary estimate B? Thank you. Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brampton Centre for his important question and hard work for his community. The supplementary estimates I tabled just a few days ago fund important investments in support of our armed forces, in support of Indigenous communities, and in support of our fight against climate change. These investments, Mr. Speaker, are the sort of things that have created 1.1 million new jobs and helped lift a million Canadians out of poverty in the last four years. We will continue to grow the middle class, to grow the economy, to protect our environment, to reduce poverty, and to give everyone a fair chance in life. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Illegal blockades are grinding our economy to a halt. In Abbotsford, my chicken, egg and dairy farmers fear they won't be able to feed their animals because the feed mills are running out of grain. Businesses are shutting down, farmers are losing millions and Canadians are out of work. Why? Because of the Prime Minister's feckless and weak leadership. Truth is, he'd rather be in Barbados lobbying for a UN Security Council seat. So to the Prime Minister. When will these blockades be removed? When will he put Canadians to work? And when will he finally get up in this house and answer a question? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to assure my colleague from BC that we're very, very aware of the impact that this is having on egg farmers, on, uh, on uh, grain farmers, on chicken farmers. We certainly understand the impact that it is having, and it is a big impact. We recognize that, and we're tracking it on a daily basis. That's why it is... I just want to remind everyone what I said when I got elected as Speaker, to think of what the people back home are thinking of you when you open your mouth. So just hopefully they're proud of what you're saying. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing certain members that I usually have respect for and are usually very quiet and they're even shouting. So I just want to remind everyone to calm down and listen. The Honourable Member for tra or Transportation, or Mr. Minister Thank of Transportation. Speaker, I, I just want to repeat that we're very conscious of the impact this is having on dairy position. farmers, on egg farmers, on chicken farmers, on all farmers, grain farmers as well. We are tracking that on a daily basis so that we have an accurate assessment of the impact, exactly. which is considerable. And that Absolutely. is why we are working so hard to resolve this problem. Exactly. Member for West Nova. 
The Prime Minister's weak leadership has led Atlantic Container Lines to stop using the Port of Halifax. Instead, they will now use American ports. Mm. The CEO of the Port of Halifax, Andy Abbott, said there are virtually no containers left in Ontario to even truck goods. Their Canadian operations have been shut down for almost two weeks. The Port of Halifax is at risk of never seeing that container traffic again. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister show leadership and help lift the blockade? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. My, my colleague uh, raises a, a very important point because uh, even though at this point we're talking mainly about the stoppage of trains in this country, those trains typically do go to ports and this is having an impact on the ports, there's no question about it. And that is why we are working so hard to find a durable solution uh, and, and a solution that goes through dialogue so that we can resolve this for the long term. Well, member for Sirius Moose Mountain. Mr. Speaker, Canadian farmers depend on rail service to get their goods to market. They are now planning for the spring and need to sell their crop and pay the cash advancements following a poor harvest season. With dramatically reduced rail speeds and blockades happening across Canada, it is clear that the Liberals do not care about the importance of rail for farmers no, they don't. based on their lack of action. How will the Prime Minister ensure grain gets to market in the face of these blockades? And, and once again, that's why we're working so hard. But I do want to make a point. There are trains that are moving in the West. There are trains that are picking up uh, uh, natural resources and moving them across the country. The, the challenge, of course, is that we want to get rid of all the blockades so that we can get all the trains moving. And that's why we're working so hard to find a long-term, peaceful, durable solution. The member for Ottawa South. Mr. Speaker, by introducing the national housing strategy, our government's committed to addressing housing shortages and high housing costs. I've heard from many, many families in Ottawa South who have expressed concern about their ability to find a safe and affordable place that they can call home. Could the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development please update us on what our government is doing to ensure that Ottawa families can access high quality and affordable housing options? Good question. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, we uh, introduced the national housing strategy in order to restore federal uh, leadership in housing. Here, here. Uh, leadership. We have made unprecedented investments uh, that have resulted in over a million Canadians to find a place to call home. Just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to update this House that we announced an investment of over $115 million here, here. in Ottawa that Excellent will increase work. the supply of affordable housing uh, for Ottawa families, resulting in the assistance of over 321 families wow. to find a place to call home. Here, here, here. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Mr. Speaker, trade deals affect every part of Canadians' lives, from jobs to drug prices to the environment. After extensive negotiations with the government, we were able to deliver a meaningful step forward to make Canadian trade negotiations more open and transparent. We're bringing more decisions out of the back room and into the light. For future deals, the government will need to give 90 days notice of its intent to negotiate, table negotiation objectives 30 days before they begin, and provide an economic impact assessment with the ratifying legislation. Can the Deputy Prime Minister confirm the government's commitment to moving ahead with these improvements? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we welcome the proposals from the member for Elmwood Transcona, and we will be formally amending the government's policy on tabling treaties in Parliament in line with his excellent suggestions. It has been a pleasure to work with him. I also appreciate his work to ensure an expeditious ratification of the new NAFTA. It's a shame that I can't say the same of the Conservatives, who used to be the party of free trade. Unfortunately, thanks to their weak and feckless leadership,
from Coastal GasLink and other LNG boosters is the claim that shipping our LNG overseas will be good for the climate crisis and reduce greenhouse gases overall. Unfortunately, that claim isn't true. I want to ask the minister if he's aware of recent studies that show a dangerous spike in greenhouse gas methane emissions as a result of fracking and that fracked gas has the same carbon footprint as coal. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Thank you, my honourable colleague, for her question and her environmental advocacy. Mr. Speaker, we are taking climate change very seriously. That's why we put in place the most robust plan in Canadian history, over 50 measures that will help us meet our Paris targets, Mr. Speaker. Coupled with our investments, we're 75 per cent of the way there, but we know we need to not only meet them... I, I just want to interrupt the honourable member for a second. There's some shouting going back and forth from the front benches. I just want to point out that we're trying to hear the answer. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, so not only do we meet them but exceed them, Mr. Speaker, we owe it to our kids and grandkids, and that's why I welcome any discussions and any work with not only my Honourable Colleague but all members of this House. Look at how we can use technology and our natural resources to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions here in Canada and all around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before we go to the point of order, I'd like to uh, draw attention of the members of the presence of the in the gallery, the Honourable Bronwyn Eyre, Minister of Energy and Resources, Minister Responsible for Sask Water, and Minister Responsible for Sask Energy for the province.